So I'm going to call uh, to order the meeting of the Finance Committee uh, for March 27, 2018. We have two things on our agenda tonight. Um, and we do not have Laura here. So I will call a roll. Councilor Carney? Present. Councilor Sierra? Here. Councilor Murphy? Me. And Councilor Bard, we have not seen yet. So. Was there some was this originally at five? It, it, it originally was going to be at four, and we made it five for the water sewer rates so that if people wanted to come, it was like after work. And then and we put the audit at four. So the, oh, first, the first thing we're going to do is the audit with Mr. Scanlon, and then after that at five, we'll do water and sewer rates. And it got made five so that if any members of the public wanted to come, it was after working hours. So that uh, they'd be able to. Why did I send her a text while we're sitting there? That's okay, just a reminder that, that, that it's now. Um, because we don't have Laura, we do not have minutes from our previous meeting, so we'll do that next well, next week in our council meeting. Um, so the first thing that we do have that we can do is the FY 2017 okay. end of year audit review by Tom Scanlon from Scanlon Associates. Okay, I don't talk for an hour. Well, we're sorry. hoping we want to get our money worth out here. We figured we'd be here for an hour. Do your best, okay? <laughs> I will try. Uh, everyone got the documents. Mm -hmm. right? uh, Back out. Uh, let, let me, um, we've introduced ourselves to Mr. Scanlon, and you have an associate here with you. Oh, yeah, Jeff Gendro. Jeff's here. Manager. And just um, so that folks know, our finance director is here, our collector treasurer is here, our auditor is here, and our principal assessor is here. Uh, in case there are any questions for anybody that come up that they would have an answer to. And also, Councillor Nash is uh, sequestered in the back of the room and has promised to behave himself uh, <laughs> throughout the meeting. So, Mr. Scanlon, the floor is yours. All right, sounds good. Uh, so, I was going to walk through the financial uh, part with you. It's a bigger one. Uh, just a couple. To begin, uh, you know, we had no disagreements with management in the audit. Uh, we had no problems with the audit. It was very smooth. Uh, Financial reporting is in good shape. Uh, I mean by that, financial transaction comes into the system with accountability is very good. Um, that'd be worth noting. Uh, we gave no significant uh, adjustments this year, except for a couple that clear up the water and sewer variances that we discussed in a prior year that we're both going to get the management letter. Um, other than that, the audit went pretty smooth. Uh, we were here in October, November, we finished, uh, we had been completed by December. And the city did receive an unmodified opinion, uh, which is on page three and four. Uh, that's what bond companies will look at, what grant awarding agencies will look at. Um, it's the best opinion you can get. Uh, so when you go to the bond market, it will serve the, the purpose. Um, and the finance uh, department should be congratulated on that. Uh, so I was going to kind of walk through the financial statements with you, kind of. Where your reserves are, how they how they fared, uh, things that jump out at you. So on pages 16 and 17, uh, these, these are your entity-wide statements. Uh, I think they want to that way. You see, they're accountants. Uh, they're full of coal. You'll see capital assets. Where you Go down to page 16, the first column, the governmental funds. Uh, that's your main operating fund. Um, you can see you have fixed assets of 98 million uh, non-current assets. You don't budget for depreciation in your budget. In your budget uh, here you do. Here it's full of cruel, so no deferred revenue, uh, whatever you bill for allowance account. Um, some things that jump out on the page at you is uh, an unrestricted governmental, and you see 73 million with brackets around there. It's never good to have your net position in a negative. Uh, the two drivers of that, um, you look under non-current liabilities. You'll see OPEP obligation of approximately $50 million, $49.7 million. That is a driver that has a promise to make to your employees that you will pay health insurance at a certain point in time when they retire. Um, I'm not too sure that's the real number as we say for some in their tries should not zero but I'm not too sure it's 49 million there's a lot of uh, assumptions that go into it like discount rates um, but it's the best way we can measure it for accounting purposes um, it's really the way you are, are looking at it you did adopt uh, an OPEP trust to combat that liability I 
June 30th, uh, there was approximately 433,000 in it. Um, I can tell most of our clients, our clients is really, they're not gonna fund 49 million in your budget, we know that, but it's how you approach what it is. It is a, it is a real life bill, you did make a promise. Uh, and that should be kind of factored into your budgets and it should be part of your thought process when you're hiring, when someone retires and you're backfilling those positions. That should be part of your thought process now is hey, this is part of the job cost. Um, maybe we should put a part of their salary away to the OPEB trust. And also, OPEB trust is really a long term thinking. You're really looking at the line 2027, 2028. And those budgets is at one point do I build up the trust to, to where I can start taking it out and impacting my budget. Because um, when you look at OPEB costs, really the only way they go away is as people expire. Um, it's really the only driver how your OPEB cost will go away. So I, that, that is the, one of the key drivers of 73. Then the other driver of that 73 deficit is the net pension liability of 54 million. You are in a pay, you are in a funding schedule to have with the retirement system. So at some point in time, like 2032, Susan? Yes. Uh, yeah. You'll be fully funded. So you are in a payment schedule with that. Uh, so those are the two driving those any. Are you looking at the liabilities line, the OPEC payable? Yep. Yeah. And then right below the net pension liability of 54 million. I see. Mm -hmm. Well, those two are the big drivers of the mm -hmm. deficit unrestricted at 73. And those are typical of any municipality. Very typical. Everybody owns the same. Everyone issue. owns the same. So it's how you look at it's them. Um, OPEP is the big elephant in the room. It is something to take serious. I just, I wouldn't. That's the requirement that we pay our pension. That's your net pension liability. Right. So you are on a funding schedule for that. So that's not too, too much to worry about. So that's going on your financials. The OPEP. Is you made promises, um, you're not funding it. And this, this, in the good old days, didn't show up until Gatsby changed, and we had Correct. to start putting it in here. Correct. So for a long time, you never saw it. You never saw it. it. Just was out there. It's always been out there. It yeah. just didn't wind up on a schedule. When Correct. you said we've made payments, I mean promises, and we haven't filled them, is that just to future pension be beneficiaries, or? Yeah, on, on the health insurance side. So well, you were active. Not pension, you mean health insurance. Correct, yeah. We're paying as we go. So we are fulfilling our promises. We just haven't set aside money for those retirees to pay their health insurance. So we're paying it as we go. We don't have and which line insurance. is that? The net pension liability? That's your open <coughs> liability. That's your 49 million. Okay, and the net pension liability is a different line, and that's? That's your actual pension. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you, are, and you are funding that. Okay, so the OPEB is just the one that's not funded or at, we're paying as we go. Oh, correct. I mean, they kind of the whole world's on pay as you go with that right now. Um, <laughs> but it's really long term <coughs> thinking and kind of the thinking process is the only way for OPEB to go away is really the expiration of people or cutting down your staff. Mm -hmm. So it's a problem everyone has. It's a problem everyone has. Uh, or a single payer. Yeah, uh, if single payer no, so came in, you come up away. here because you'll be in front of the microphone. We'll be able to hear your questions better. So there we go. <laughs> so, um, so the fifty million—it's a cumulative guesstimate of what the future costs are going to be. But currently, we include those people under our our group for health insurance. All right. So we're accounting for it that way, and. Um, so are you suggesting that we should actually be putting money into a fund to cover that? Yeah, but you do right now. You have, I think, called an OPEP trust. There's 433,000, I want to say, June 30th in it. I want to say you funded it 200,000. Yeah. yeah, we're increasing it every year in the budget by over 100,000. And then the plan is when the retirement assessment is fully funded, when the retirement system is fully funded, say, 3032, the roughly at the moment six million but by then will be probably nine million dollars a year that the city is putting in we will then shift that to fund this opep liability so we have a plan we have a plan mm -hmm. okay. it's just right. we have to take care of retirement first mm -hmm. so that's a long-term plan really i mean the, the whole kind of theory behind opep is one position can cause multiple health insurance costs as people retire you say police chief your police chief retires, 
you backfill it, we have that retiree cost, the health insurance, and you have the current. And if that chief retires, then new chief comes in. So you have three health insurances costs in one position. And again, this has been around forever. It's just recently that accounting standards had us actually put it in here. So this is this is not a new thing. Yeah, 2009, the accounting standards kicked in and said, you gotta start recognizing this liability on your balance sheets. And it kind of was, everyone said, well, look at the big liability and kind of laughed, you know, say, yeah, nothing we can do. And now it's kind of, okay, we gotta start putting money away for this because it's real somewhere in there. I mean, if you look at your retirees' health costs in your budget alone on a cash basis, that has nothing but gone up. So the, the other but so we're accounting for this group of retirees right now. Yeah. So and regrettably people are gonna move on at, and then they will be replaced by new retirees. Do we see that pool growing or I mean it sounds like we're we're kind of accounting for it already. I mean maybe we should have some sort of trust fund, but is is do we see a change within the retire number of people in the retired pool? Well, I, I would say you do. I mean, I can I can look at that and answer your question when I, I have the OPEB reports. We have them done every two years. We have an actuarial study, right. and it shows me how many people are retirees. And I was just trying to look up how much of the our you know our roughly ten million dollar health insurance. How much is retirees? Right. Um, but there's more actives than retirees. Um, and I don't think it's shifting dramatically one way or another, but people are living longer. Right. And you know, and it also is like in public safety, they can retire early, so you're more likely to have multiple plans for a public safety person right. than you're going to have for somebody else. Right. So, for yeah. any of our teachers, or but they're all in the state retirement plan, and that, so it's really just folks who the have participated in. Oh, we, teachers also. The teachers are in. MTRB for their retirement, but we are funding the retirement health insurance, the health insurance for retired teachers. Oh, we are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah they're a they're a huge, they're yeah, like the job. biggest yes. part yeah. of the retiree part. Yeah. And luckily, they don't retire early. Like public well, safety they can doesn't. retire earlier <coughs> than, than not at fifty-five, like police officers. So I think the, police officers, and electricians, plus. and other high-risk uh, occupations can retire at fifty-five. Teachers can also retire, or they have a, what, don't they have that like 55 plus? They have an option, yeah. but it's, 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 it's decreased, but for those other public safety people who have more yes, they, jobs, yes, they, they, they have a Yes, they have an accelerated. Yeah, the group four people. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, no, it's a real, usually we, we see in the smaller communities, you'll see the retiree populations not growing. You know, it was five people. 10 years ago and it's five people now. So OPEP's probably not a too concerned to um, a town of that size, but Northampton, I would say your retiree population is growing. Just because people are coming here, working and then retiring, more than like a smaller community where they're leading that community and retiring somewhere else. The, the other thing with the OPEP study that they do is they basically take and they project out all, basically everybody who's eligible for health insurance and that's not the case so when I look at the OPEP study it's saying that we have the liability for a thousand employees and 800 retirees we don't have that many people on health insurance because but they have to project out as if everyone, takes everyone who's eligible could take it and that's not the case mm -hmm. so and there's discounts rates in there and there's uh, medical trends in there so there's a lot of assumptions involved, and that's the best way you can measure for accounting purposes. That's why I wouldn't concentrate on the 49 million, um, but your liability is something that's really about forward thinking of when I'm hiring new employees, there's a cost associated with that. So yeah, if, they, if they stay, right. you got them. Yep, yeah. and it's really training department heads. That is that, are you, you good with that? I'm good, this, oh. is, this is, everybody's thinking the right stuff, thanks. All right. I don't know what I'm thinking. <laughs> don't say that. Yeah, it was it was easier before that had to go in there. <laughs> um, that's pages 16 and 17. I mean, those are the kind of cheap things to jump off the page at you. Yeah. Um, on pages 18 and 19, <clears throat> these are more your traditional financial statements. Uh, can relate to uh, where your free cash comes from, whichever number you, you want to kind of 
see is uh, we'll concentrate right on the general fund there. Um, and this is a balance sheet. You can see there's no fixed assets on here. It's not full accrual. You see it, the unavailable revenue, which is the amount of money that's left to be collected, like your real estate, you see what's in your motor vehicle. Uh, we look at unassigned fund balance in the general fund, 14 million. That should be the makeup of your free cash, your stabilization fund, and your overlay account. Um, which when we look at those, your free cash was 4.1 million. Uh, you have three stabilization funds that make up 8.2 million. Um, then your overlay balance is 1.4 million. Um, so the, they're matching right up to your financial statements, which is always, we usually like to see, hey, my reserve, you talk about free cash and stabilization, now you can kind of relate to it to your financial statements or the upset of cash. That, that's what gets us a good bond rating. Yes, correct. Uh, and your your ratings are about 14% of um, your budget. Uh, roughly those numbers together, that 14, budget by 88 million. 10% is considered good. Um, so you're between 10 and 15%, which uh, when you go out to the bond market, and bond rating is so fast, what they're looking at. And then you turn to page 19. This is the change. Uh, again, when we look, you'll see the net change in general fund fund balance of the two million four ninety three nine seventy eight. Their number from the bottom. That uh, that number tells people a lot when they look at your financial statements. That means your general fund increased one point uh, two point four million. The makeup of that is is. Uh, a component of fund balance is reserved for incumbences. So if you don't spend it in one year, your budget carries carry mm -hmm. over next. Carries over. So if you have a change in that number, um, you do. If you look on page 22, and if you look at the first column on page 22, that's the 5.2 million that's coming in for encumbrances. And then if you look at the second to last column, amounts carried forward. See the 6.5. It increased roughly about 1.3 billion. Uh, chief driver that is in the capital line item. You see with the 3.9, 5.3. So when that increases, you'll see an increase in your fund balance because you appropriated the money. Money came in through your tax rate. Mm -hmm. You didn't spend it yet. So of that 2.4 uh, million increase on uh, base 19. 1.3 that has associated with encumbrances. Those are considered one time, so we back away from that. And then you're left with a difference about 1.2 million, and that's the net increase in your reserves. Um, and that is telling bond companies, it's telling us when we're looking at them, because we break down that number. And you have sound reserve policies, means you're putting money away, um, you know, spending it. Um, again, you took free cash and you transferred that. The net result of stabilization between all three of them was 1.2 million, and that's the increase. So you have it coming in your tax rate, you're not using the fund balance, therefore that's why it's increasing. That is good to see, and it's also sound financial policies. Um, and one thing I would like to point out, which I talked to Susan about the last two audits and just uh, the other day was, you adopted a fiscal stabilization fund, um, you haven't touched it yet. And I think the original goal was you were gonna tap into it. So we're gonna use, we started it in 14 and 15 we we're going to put money we we're going to use it in 16 and 17 and potentially seek an override in 18 so we didn't use it in 14 15 we didn't use it in 16 17 we didn't use it in 18 and i and don't know yet whether we'll need to tap into it for, for 19 but this coming budget for the coming budget yes yes things are you know there's still a lot of unknowns for that so and it's, and it's sitting, you can see where it's sitting on your financial statement. You can see you're not using it. So, I mean, that's pretty made a promise that you were going to do this and keep to your financial policies. And your financial statements are dictating that. Um, so, I mean, I think the city should be committed for that. And sitting on city council and being in charge of it, you know, voting free cash and voting your budget, I mean, you should be committed for that too. The whole financial plan you have in place is working and it's on your financial statements. And readers of it can see that. Of it. course, you love to see these numbers, but people like us, you know, people always want us to be spending more on other things. So, correct. Just kind of that balance of, you know, what's good fiscal 
policy, but then what is meeting needs and for when there are always increased needs. Correct. And yeah. just I always tell city council support plan that they talk to, it's a lot easier to make a decision in your shoes when you have 10 to 15 percent in reserves, mm -hmm. and then you have a financial policy where you have the budget flexibility to put it right back into reserves within a two-year period. It makes your decision, I mean, I think, a little bit easier for yourself. So you can manage it, and then you're making sound decisions more than because I have no reserves. I look against my levy ceiling. I gave you, you know. For some of those, we have no choice, like the OPEP liability <coughs> and the pension and the health insurance, and some of those things have to be yep. have to be funded. Mm -hmm. with it. And it's nice to see because within the last 10 years, you know, we had negative free cash there for yes. for one year. We yes. didn't do any capital improvements because we, you know, once the, the state changed their uh, disbursement, we went into negative free yeah. cash. That was, yeah. That was, was 10 years ago or so. Yeah, I think it was 2009, 2010. 2010, yeah. I think. We yeah. started the year with no free cash and $4,000 in stabilization. We made a big commitment at seven. I mean, that's kind of, I mean, I think that's, should be congratulated. Um, and again, one of the positive policies you're making, decisions you're making, um, I know I say keep them up. Mm -hmm. They're being very sound, the way you're using free cash. But we do, we still have a very high collection rate on our property taxes. Yep, right? yep, no, that's, that, uh, that's coming. I don't want to rush that. I know you're getting there, but when I'm looking at the property tax revenue for the general fund, uh, you got a lot of time. Yeah, no, I was going to say I got You don't rush. <laughs> One's your meter. So I'm going to put my meter in for. We have an app now. You can use a parking app. Oh, really? Increase your time. Yeah. Park mobile. But if, Park mobile. But if we get you, it'll just go to free cash, which is. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That'd be the scamming company contribution. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, also on page 18, I just want to point out, is you, you'll see the stormwater fund. <laughs> um, we're showing it as a governmental fund. It can be easily shown as an enterprise fund. Uh, if you did adopt an enterprise fund under Mass General Law, and it's accounted for that in that regard. But for gap purposes, you have to meet certain definitions to make it. Um, it was a 50-50 call. It could go the way we like to show it as a governmental fund because I think it's more user friendly than it is showing fixed assets associated with a depreciation, full accrual, the whole nine yards. This is on the modified accrual. I think it's the fund is so has a lot of public eyes on it. It's, it's, so we show it as a governmental fund to where it's easier to read. You can look and it'll match up to Susan's numbers more than it's on. Cool. That was kind of a decision if you look at it, say, geez, isn't this an enterprise fund? Well, for mass general law, your budget purposes is enterprise fund, but for gap purposes, we show it as a governmental fund. I believe it's more user friendly to read. Okay, any questions, particularly on, on, on that? Um, and then uh, under non major funds, that would be your grants, your revolving funds, your capital projects funds. Um, I always encourage you on page 77 to 80, there's a breakout of them. I uh, encourage you as governance is to really review them and see if there's any accounts that kind of look strange to you or has a high balance in them or um, what are we doing? How uh, do we balance with the mini behind them? The more eyes and getting them back, those non major funds outside the um, general budget, uh, I, I think is good. Uh, I, I will say that your finance team does have a quarterly policy and yearly policy to review those accounts and really go through and see are they being used, can we close them out. Um, so you have an aggressive policies and procedures on that, um, the finance team has. So I will say that. Uh, the last uh, statement I kind of just want to go over, which I think is always important, is on page 22, touch briefly. Yeah, this is your budget versus actual. This really kind of shows you where your free cash is uh, coming from. Uh, the first column discusses the encumbrances, which is the carryovers from the prior year unspent. Uh, the original budget is the original budget you vote that you uh, meeting going to the fiscal year. The bond budget is after all free cash votes, transfers uh, for available funds. Uh, the most important columns that column all the way out to the right. Uh, 
does a heightened fear against your budget. And you can see the top part on revenue side is 2.2 million fair to the good, and then the expenditure side is 2.1. A very good mix of how your free cash is being generated, not just one-sided where your your four million dollars in free cash against their advice is not all coming from expenses. Uh, you're not relying on one thing into your uh, budget to generate the free cash. Um, you can see on top on your on your revenue side, the excise and uh, other taxes, which is more vehicle excise, uh, very conservative, three hundred ninety-one thousand came in excess. Um, very conservative how you look at the revenues. Hotel and motel tax, again, that's very, based on your economy, it can fluctuate, it's like a more big big size, conservative on that. Um, the charges for services, that's 649,000. Ambulance is the chief driver on that one, um, the excess of the receipts. And then uh, license permits and fees, uh, 848,000. Uh, we got the marijuana that one time, 100,000 flowing in there. Uh, the permits exceeded it. Um, construction permits, about 150. And ambulance program uh, revenue that flowed through there. Uh, so you kind of have a nice blend in that license permits and fees so you're not over budgeting in certain categories. Uh, and then you see the deficit under intergovernmental that is offset directly with the state assessments down below uh, those with the charter school. Those two kind of fluctuate together. And this will just schedule this 4.3 million that you see between the two. And that is exactly should be your free cash amount that you get certified. The difference being your overlay change of about 200,000, which you appropriate to pay for payments, and then um, different I call them penalties at DOR will penalize against you for deficit accounts, fluctuation of revenues and accruals. Um, so that difference, so that number right there comes close to your free cash amount. Oh, any questions mm -hmm. Well, just so where we show in the amounts carried forward to next year, a mm -hmm. deficit of, uh, well, just a lesser amount of the six million. That amount carried. Yeah, that that's carrying forward in that the next year's budget, the six point five million. So, is that um, parenthesis show that that's how much we need to carry forward, or no, that's that's we're short, or that, that's just the way the formula is working in that call. I see. Okay. So you're not, you're not carrying anything forward in the revenue side, so it's a, it's a negative. Oh, I see, okay. And then the big change in there is that capital item, that's the biggest fluctuation in, in the incumbents call. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's kind of it on that final one. We'll touch base since we've done the collection of rate. We go all the way out back in the report to page 81. So on pages 81 to 84, these are your, your major receivables. Um, page 81 is your real estate personal property taxes. Probably your number one revenue source. And you can see the far out two columns. The last column is the actual detail in the collector's office. John Smith, the Mary Jones, that is the detail of it. And the second to last column is uh, your general ledger. And you can see there's no barrages between the two, which is very good. It means you're balancing out uh, segregation of duties, the accountant, and got the tax collector. And you can see your collection rate is 98.3. Um, I don't think that get too much better than that. Um, so this schedule tells us as auditors, and tells to tell readers of it, we got our tax collector doing a good job collecting our taxes, and we're balancing. Uh, the next page is CPA, motor vehicle. And then on page 84, you see tax liens. You don't see a high balance in tax liens. I mean, you collect them, it's not put them in a tax bill. Um, you wouldn't want to see a balance here of like $6 million. Uh, that means not paying their taxes. Um, all these schedules, when you look at them, tell them maybe our collector is doing a good job. And hey, we're balancing. The whole point of segregation and duties is collectors taking in the money, taking in the cash, accounting for it in the sub counts, all the details. And then you have your city auditors maintaining a general ledger, which is being reported there. Those two should be balanced. When those two aren't balanced, it means there's something going on. Uh, you can see there's minimal variance in which you collect um, I know we usually like to put these scheduled things that tell readers a lot about what's going on. 
that's kind of it from the financial side. Unless you have any, any other questions? questions from anyone? No, in the this is the thirteenth one of these I've sat in on, and it gets better and better. And this, I mean, the auto went really smooth this year. The free cash was certified by the best it's ever had in a long time. The schedule A submitted. I mean, just everything kind of fit nice. Uh, the management letter is the next one. I'll probably go. I'm going to go over. Um, one, one thing I will say about the city, the city is very reactionary to us in a good way is that if we see there's an issue that's addressed immediately by the time we leave field work, um, we identify an area, you know, and communication of meetings, calling to trust and by the time we leave. So, I mean, I can't say there's more communities are like that. <laughs> so, I, I probably don't want to really appreciate me and my audit staff, you know, and, uh, so want to say that um, on page four that's more informational items um, and again to keep your clean opinion your uh, unmodified opinions the new gas is coming out uh, they're getting more complex as we speak um, the first one is that 50 million dollar OPEB liability we talked about that is going to significantly change gas be 75 next year it's going to be a larger number <laughs> Um, not too sure why. Uh, well, we got used to this number that it's going to make it. Yeah, they want instead of making it proactive, you know, the, out, they're going to say, no, we're going to do the same thing as a net pension liability. We're going to have the whole thing set up on the financial statements. So you probably see that number growing. The category is about 75 million. Yeah, yeah it's going to go way up. But it's going to go way up for everybody. Yeah. So I'm not really concerned. So, And, and we are making progress with those. Yeah, and it's more the bond companies know they're not too excited about it because they understand what it is. Um, you're recognizing it, it's most important. So it's really the accounting aspect is getting it out of your financial statements. You're not penalizing the bond market. Um, so, and then there's a couple other uh, gas fees. The leases one, I will point out, it's year 2021, but that's going to be pretty significant. Um, what we talk about now is going to be with photocopier leases. I'm hoping it would change a lot from now until then. Um, I'm not too sure we want to be setting photocopier leases up on your financial statements as a liability. Um, but that's the way we read it now. Um, but we just want to make the city aware of these um, for future. So when you say leases, that means anything we are leasing? Yeah, they're changing the whole. It used to be in the, in the kind of where it's operating lease and capital lease, and for some strange reason, Someone must have read a book or something and said, ah, there's no such thing as anyone. They're all leases. Oh, okay. There's a reason why they passed it now and put it out due four years. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> I think they're anticipating we're going to change it. That's the only thing I can think of. Um, for kind of our first and our only current year comment, um, was we, we tested a lot of receipts into uh, the Treasury from the outside department to kind of Fetched it off the treasurer's office and said, okay, control the food and the treasurer's. Let's look what's going on the outside of uh, receipts coming in. Uh, one thing we'd recommend it is as they come into the treasury, that the department breaks out how much they're turning over for cash and how much they're turning over for check. How much is that much more of a solidifying the audit trail over cash um, so you can really, at any given time, Susan, uh, Chris, they have a choice they want to do an internal audit off of the department. It will be easier for them to trace the cash trail. So if a resident came in and paid cash, it should be marked on their accounting records out of the department, and it should flow right through this treasury as cash. Um, recommendation. What percentage? I can't imagine a lot of people paying cash. No, you'd be surprised, though. Maybe, I mean, I know with auditors, we, we see a lot less cash than we do several years ago, but it always surprises me how much cash is out there and the flow of it. I mean, it's, it's again, it's another matter. It's not exactly, it's not. Are credit card uh, payments considered cash? No. It's cash, cash, the old $5 bill. Okay. Presumably, this is a pretty easy fix. You just add a checkbox. Correct. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it's more <coughs> really us being tougher on the flow of it. We need to find something. There. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I say it like that. <laughs> and it just, you know, it's the recommendation, which I think Mo most everybody is doing that on their turnovers. We still have a few stragglers that don't always necessarily follow instructions. So we're actually, um, we've got like three quarters of the way drafting our internal cash control sheet. So it's it's getting close to being um, ready to distribute. Yeah, and I don't think it's a widespread no. issue. No, it's just good practice. Yes. Probably more politically sensitive than it is risk based. That's our current year comment. Uh, we walked through the prior year. Uh, again, that was kind of information on everything the year before. Uh, they addressed it. Ambulance receivables, we did, we did some more testing in the ambulance receivable and the field work. Found um, um, several issues in the field work, but since then, that was in October, uh, the city implemented new procedures all in place. And it's being both has been all reconciled, and uh, so that's what I mean. It's reactionary, and it's for the good. You know, they met with us both within two weeks. They have new procedures, so pretty confident. So, Joyce, you're balancing with they're sending you what you need to do what you need to do, correct? So, yeah. yeah, so we had a meeting with fire and and just kind of coordinated between what we needed from the billing company and what the auditor needed. So, that's all done. And the same thing on the sub ledgers, you know, we recommended breaking them out. Um, we broke them out and, you know, I think the recons are, are going a lot smoother. Um, health insurance and folding, uh, there was a lack of records on last year. Yeah, I came back, he put procedures in place. Um, I didn't rectify the majority. There's still it's not enough time in the day. Um, you know, we've tested and said, you know, we probably do a little bit more improvement, but I understand you don't have a lot of time, but you're doing the basics. Um, if you want to take it to the next level, you X, Y, and Z. Um, again, the risk there is mitigated. You're doing the core balancing of it. And then the water and sewer, storm water, any book procedures in place to balance. Uh, when I first talked about an adjustment, we did adjust those prior year variances out of the GL because they did remain the same um, for one four years. So we did the policy adjustment, and uh, uh, Joyce did book it. So we're good on that regard, and they've established procedures that they're balancing on a daily basis, um, which is good. And then the two last items, inventories. It's uh, probably more of a pipe drink for auditors. Uh, again, it's probably a low-risk area. Um, still, for insurance purposes, there should be some kind of environmental inventory of what assets they do have in the case there's a fire and what is in there. Uh, so that's more for that purpose, more than his financial statements uh, driven on that. And then the old outstanding receivables, if you looked on that last page of those receivables I showed you, there, you have a lot of older receivables when it comes to personal property and motor vehicle excise, uh, kind of statutorily driven. Uh, the excise is marked at the registry of motor vehicles. Uh, but after six years, I believe they're being removed off the registry they, now, right? They just did that like at the in December, or, I think. Yeah. yeah, so after six years, mm -hmm. I guess... The the deputy collectors will still have it on their books but the and can still collect it, yeah. but it's not, those individuals are not marked, and they did the same to parking tickets as well. Yeah, so... And Joan, where are you with, um, I know Mark, your assistant, identified all the personal property that we're sure the company doesn't exist anymore or anything. Have you taken those abatements to the board yet? Yes, but they don't want to. They don't want to abate them because there's people still, still living here, and some of them still in business. So they voted not to do it. Okay, so we'll need to we'll need to talk about that some more. So, um, so maybe I'll have to come to their meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and that's on the personal property side, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah, so that's probably your next step. I mean, probably. Yeah, because we did adopt changes there. You know, to set a minimum for personal property. Yeah, we did. Yeah, <coughs> we're now doing a thousand, so nobody gets a bill if it's less than a thousand. So. Well, you know, for years I think they got away with not paying, so they think nothing's going to happen. Well, the problem with personal property is there's no. It's mobile. <laughs> well, yeah. it's, and there's no way to collect it because you can't attach it to yeah. property. And, and it, it can it's get loaded in the back of a station wagon and drive away, you know. Yeah. Yes. 
<laughs> you could not be there anymore. Mm -hmm. it's, it, even to withhold the permits or, you know, it's a difficult process because, you know, there's so many uh, outstanding personal property taxes and a lot of them are small and some of them are larger. Um, and, you know, people have ignored them for so long and so. Yes, you've kind of got two categories. Your mortgage collect size is kind of that, the nature of that the is so much better than it used to be in the old days. Yeah. I mean, people come in, they can't get their licenses, they can't register their car. Yeah, so yeah you have a penalty, but personal property has like no stick. Correct. You, you yeah, so the more yeah, other than to die to permits or services because they have paid. Right. right. So they got the motor vehicle, you just have to do a chapter 58, section 8 abatement to get them just to remove them off the receivables. And they're on your financial statements now, it's uncollectible. Um, it's not on the collectible account for gap purposes. It's just a matter of cleaning them up on your books. It's more, it's really just going through the most more statutory literature than it is. You're going to collect them because they are marked. There is there's avenues to collect that motor vehicle that mark the registry, but after six years, the registry is even dropping it because the during your license every five years, I believe, that's probably pick for six. So if someone who's actually still living in the state is going to get caught, they don't pay their excise. Yeah, their license is going to roll over. They're, they're going to need something for the registry where they're going yeah. to... If they move to Montana and they've been back here in 10 years, you ain't going to get as yeah. much anyway. Um, and that personal property, that's more of really a local driven going through and if they still exist trying to collect or abate them against the overlay one of the two um, I would say that's probably more of the issue at this point than yeah. vehicle. And the overlay does have money to abate these yeah. so it's not an issue of we don't have enough in the overlay to basically cover them so, so I'd say that's, that's probably one thing to work on you know to close this fiscal year what round numbers what is the the uncollected personal property what page is that, Tom? Um, 81. So the back is 497000 That goes back. Back to like 70, 70, 70 to like 74. Yeah. You can see up through 13 to 16. Pretty. I mean, we did have one really big one. We did get the assessors to to the 8 of 58 for that one. That was the PVTA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, we took care of yeah. that. So we took care of that, and that got a huge chunk off. But we are working on this, and, and we had Mark go through and find all the businesses that no longer really exist. And we kind of made three piles. People that we don't think are around anymore, people we're not sure about, the people we know are still around. <laughs> um, so that's how far we've gotten so far on this. So, um, But we are working on it. So. Mm -hmm. Well, collecting anything on it would be great. Yeah. The ones that are still around, they'll, yeah. they'll need us for something at some point. That's right. Yeah. I, I did read about a town that got a personal property amnesty. They, had, they got it through the state legislature where they could offer like an amnesty. Because we have some people whose interest on this exceeds their actual bill. So I did read about one town who did, did an amnesty program years ago, but you had to get special legislation to do it. So that was one thing I was thinking about, if we could have an amnesty time and people could clear their account, like at least the ones who are still around could clear their account by not paying the interest and just paying mm -hmm. them. But that's- Not, not, th not this year without a state rep. Yeah, we're, yeah. <laughs> but it was, and you know, I was just starting to research it to see if that might be a uh, carrot to kind of get some of this money in, so. I'll have to do some, I, I wasn't aware of that. I'll, I'll look up the town and tell it. From somewhere by Boston. Or it was Boston. around Boston, and it was one town who did it. Yeah. yeah. I know I have that in my folder. Yeah, I, re I remember, I remember yeah. we talked about that before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, do you want to ex just send the sheriff out if they don't pay, like, well, I just sent like uh, I just sent about thirty letters to um, anyone who had a t two thousand um, seventeen balance over two hundred dollars. So we sent tax statements, and a lot of those tax statements also included prior year balances. And of those thirty or thirty five notices, I got two calls. So they're still ignoring. 
So okay. Tom, are you going to just explain what the third oh, packet is, why. just so you guys know, because um, this one was, you know, interesting in that we are a sanctuary city. So if they were to pull the plug on our federal funds, this um, the third audit shows how much we're getting from the federal. Yeah. So the third audit is a. Uh, they call it a single audit, which is uh, only federal driven. Um, each uh, federal agency has done compliance supplement the way you manage the grants. Um, the way single audit works, they thought that if you, if you spend over 750000 in a year, you have to be audited. That particularly drives your audit. Um, and in that, there's certain formula you come up with what federal grants you're going to test. It's basically, if that's 40% of the federal expenditures and driven by type A and type B grants. Um, and the city receives the um, page 11. And the city received 5.3 million in federal funds. Uh, the programs that we tested um, is your community development grant, uh, HUD, and then school grants of Title I and your SCAD cluster. And we found no compliance issues between grant requirements uh, and the compliance supplement and the testing of those grants. So you get clean opinions and all grants we tested. Um, you know, your grant management here is excellent between the development and the school grants. Um, you need to maintain your grant management very well. So um, it's always good to see that you receive 5.3 million federal funds when you take it in those terms that Susan put. Uh, your chief ones are your school grants and your community development. Mary and I tried to send you the text, but I must not have had your correct um, mobile number. I just I realized you probably thought it was fine. Yeah. 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 I think, I, I think like Susan has a packet for you too. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, Councillor Nash was there. using it. Where'd he go? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did he leave? Started it. Yeah. He was looking at no, it. You can take this one because I'll just get another one. Yes. Because he picked it up, he had a question about it. Oh, that's just the total of 11, right? Yeah, total. Oh, I see it. Yeah, that's from all the previous pages from the... Got it. Oh, okay. You know, some of them are little and some of them are big, but... And yeah, farm education is the most... Uh, mm -hmm. Community development's on page 7. Oh, okay. So these are all the federal grants, yep. whether they're school or school Correct, that's everything else. Yeah. So part of the process is we have to come up with a lease schedule of all your federal grants, and then this is what our lease schedule's off. Our work paper, and then you come to a total, and you have to classify what's type A and what's type B program. So you with 300, and then from there, you assess the high risk and low risk. The whole matrix you got to go through. Mm -hmm. I try not to do that work paper. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, this might not be your area of expertise, but actually, maybe the mayor can answer this. But is, am I correct that it's only the DOJ grants that would be affected um, that they could withhold for sanctuary status? Not they're um, <laughs> so they're trying. Uh, they've obviously tried. Uh, we we think that ironically, when the process started, they said we're going to take all your federal money away, but don't worry, we're not going to touch your police grants. And then they realized, oh, I crap! The only thing we can take away is police grants um, <laughs> because you can't put conditions on like an education program that have nothing to do with the education program. So like immigration enforcement has nothing to do with that. So. Um, but again, there's, uh, there is, um, uh, there is uh, a fight going on about whether or not they can even withhold uh, federal uh, DOJ grants. And there's a large grant called the Brendan, whatever, Byrne yeah. Grants. Edward Byrne Grants. Edward Byrne Grants, not Brendan Byrne. Awesome. That's the New Jersey uh, rest stop. It's an exit. It's an exit. Oh, uh, yeah, rest stop on the New Jersey Turnpike. Um, Edward Byrne uh, Grants. And actually, the city of Chicago 
has a major uh, lawsuit uh, going, a uh, federal suit going over denial of, because they're basically block grants. And so it actually, we have signed on to amicus briefs um, supporting them, that you can't deny them this block grant funding. So it's still an open question, and, uh, and it's making its way through the courts. Um, but for example, we don't have any of those block grants right now. Um, they used to, we used to fund some position of uh, the school resource officer with that. It's no longer funded with that. So we, it doesn't affect Northampton, but it's still an open question whether it will someday in the future. So, so even though we receive over $5 million in federal grants, yes. the, our DOJ grants are, are a tiny fraction. Yes, indeed. Yes, yeah. it's a small, I mean, most of it's education. Right. I, would, yeah. I would assume most yeah. of it's education. Yeah. Education. Huh? And ag, probably USDA for um, yeah, for school lunches yeah. and stuff. So yeah, but a lot of that's based on statutes. You can't just take it away. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. and that's what I think the president quickly found out. Um, he does tend to speak off the cuff. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. The devil's in the details. Just, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So, any other questions for Mr. Scanlon? I just want to say thank you to the three staff people oh, here her, who yeah. are all of this money kind of flows through all of their hands so well not literally but <laughs> oh, it, it does in my office <laughs> <laughs> on, pa on paper so I mean these are basically the three offices who constitute the work that go you know mm -hmm. the, the financial work that goes and definitely I'll just say again over the last 13 years I've been looking at these the management letters getting thinner and thinner mm -hmm. and the suggestions are getting dealt with from one fiscal year to the next and these guys are doing a good job so it's a lot easier doing this audit meeting now than it was 10 years ago yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> even with the Gatsby changes yes yeah not have the Gatsby changes then. <laughs> <laughs> all right so um if there are no other questions we have a motion to accept the audit so moved second any discussion on that? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, and we will make our report to full council next week that we've reviewed the audit and think it's acceptable. And thank you all for coming. Thank you. Great question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The, the only, uh, the, the only uh, actually the, What's the day? I don't know this one is. I can look from the email to see when when the last version of this went out. The only the only thing I might mention is that if for some reason uh, Council and Incipient Wisdom wants to say hi to you and have you come in, yeah. we may we'll, we'll call on you if they will make our report and if they are in full Council wants to have you come see them, no we'll let you know. But we're happy. Good. Just pick a night. There's no. Uh, no, oh, tactical okay. gear on the uh, agenda. Yeah, absolutely. We don't have two hours of public comment about that. Three hour public comment. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, what I might suggest, we can, because we have the public hearing in five minutes, so we can do is take a quick recess break and come back at uh, five o'clock and we'll do, Mayor will do the water store presentation. Thank you. Well, they were telling me they could.
same results in other communities having a problem. Everywhere you go to a meeting, that's what they talk about. Everybody's like, there's no Everyone complains. And the only way to do it is to move the water sewer rates to five so that anybody that works in the community might want to come and come after work. And then rather than do it later, or to get it timely out of the way, we're going to get it done. They're out of business. They're business. They're stuck. You can't. I think Susan said it was actually. Yeah. Susan said it was a lot of that for her. Yeah. And there's nothing we can do about it. It isn't like real estate where eventually it gets cleaned up. Right, right. Most of it. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, eventually it does. It does, really. If it's not, if it gets sold or somebody takes over. You know, we charge nothing. Yeah. I mean, the one thing we can do is, and what I wanted to do is once we clean the ones that are in the process, the ones that are, we can see if they have building permits. Well, the ones that the list is so big, I need to like. They don't have liquor license. The one on the property. Oh right, because you're already doing that. Thanks, Tom. Thank you, Thank you. Nice meeting you again. I do that much. It's so much better. Because our job is to do everything. Good at it. Good at it. And that's why we have the order to come in. Yeah, 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 Love doing, but it's just that then we travel with Sister. Yeah. She likes it. She's really liking it. I'm like, I'm kind of surprised that she likes it, but she does. Yeah, no, not because it's organized. No, no, no. Probably better. I, you know, I came for the water raising in the early days, so I'm not here for the water raising, but I came for this is great because I, this is the sort of thing I need to hear twice anyway, so I'm not working at it. My mother's the artist's brother. No, 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 Like I had to go early because I had a one o'clock mm -hmm. appointment in Florence. Yeah, Actually, in really really Florence, yeah. where I was going, so, was um, the, the mayor had lunch with Florence Civic and Business. Yeah, yeah. 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 I went to lunch to here. Right. 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 It's like something. Right. 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 Right.
City Council. A public hearing will be held on Tuesday, March 27, 2018, um, at 5 o'clock in the Council Chambers. Uh, being held by the Council Committee on Finance, and we'll consider the proposed FY 2019 water and sewer rates and hear anyone from the public that wishes to comment. So, do we have a motion to open a public hearing? Move to open the motion. A second. Excellent. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So, we'll recognize the mayor and uh, Director Lascalia okay. will make their presentation. I'm just going to give just introductory remarks and then turn it over to uh, Director Lascalia. Um, so just by way of history, as counselors know, uh, this is now, I believe, the fourth fiscal year that under our uh, new process that um, was driven by the administrative order reorganizing city government that uh, water rates are um, you know, developed by BBW, recommended by the mayor, and require approval by uh, the City Council. Um, you may recall that the first year of that was FY15, um, and in FY15 you know, and 16, uh, we made no changes to the rates. We left the rates uh, level for 15 and 16. Um, I then went out uh, getting public feedback, including in FY16, um, and we did a significant study, um, and we developed and implemented the new tiered rate system. Um, primarily with an eye to making sure that there was um, sort of more fairness built into the rates in terms of smaller users versus larger users. We also wanted to build conservation um, into the rates. Uh, so we created the two-tiered system for customers with one inch uh, meter or smaller, which is pretty much a significant majority of our customers. And those tend to be either small businesses or pretty much all residential. Um, and then we have the one inch or larger, uh, uh, which, uh, which again is a set rate um, uh, for, for people with one inch or larger meters. Um, sewer, uh, again, uh, sewer is, we also made a change. We based the sewer rate on 80% of metered water consumption. It used to be 100% of metered water consumption. So we went through a pretty extensive public process. We you know, created, um, you know, tried to explain to people uh, how the, how the rate structure would affect them. Um, we also built in for the first time um, uh, low income provisions that if you were to qualify for the low income exemptions uh, that we have in some of our other utilities, you would qualify for a discount here. Um, and then the final thing I would say is that the, the one of the other issues with, tier, with the tiered structure on the residential side is we wanted to also build in conservation. So uh, for the first 16 uh, CCFs, uh, we have a much lower rate uh, for the tier one. Um, and it's only um, you know, every drop of water above 16 CCF that you pay a higher tier two rate. Uh, so we were also trying to acknowledge people that were working to conserve uh, water, particularly you know, some of the elderly folks that we had heard from who you know, live alone and, and don't use that much water. So we wanted to also have an eye toward that. So uh, those rates were implemented. 
um, in FY17. Um, as you know, last year in FY18, um, we came before you uh, to sort of discuss the rates. We actually did not um, recommend an increase in the rates last year um, either. Um, so we maintained the same rates uh, for FY18 that were in place for FY17. Um, and now, um, and partially, I think when you talk to Director Lascalia, part of it was as she was coming in a new administration and looking at the projects, the capital projects, and assessing the capital projects. Um, at the time, the, uh, the the capacity that they needed in terms of doing those projects uh, did not justify the rate increase in FY17. So there was no recommendation for that at the time. Um, so the proposal before you now. Um, is to make uh, uh, sort of change, three changes to the rates, uh, those three volumetric rates. Um, for the tier one uh, consumption, uh, which is the, again the lowest uh, water users and it's the lower rate to, um, to encourage consumption, um, we're proposing a 1% increase in that rate. Um, so that would go from uh, $4.36 per CCF uh, to four dollars and forty cents, so it would be a four cent increase on that uh, on that line. On the tier two uh, consumption, it would be a two percent increase, um, and that would go from the current five dollars and eighty two cents to five dollars and ninety four cents. Um, and then um, on the customers with meters larger than one percent, we basically mimic the two percent again, two percent, uh, and that's going from uh, five dollars and seventy two cents to five dollars and eighty four cents. Um, on sewer, uh, the sewer, we're proposing a 2% increase on sewer as well, uh, and that's going from uh, $7.52 to $7.67. Um, so that is the, um, that's the proposal before you. Uh, Director Lascalia provided you with a two-page memo, and I think it'd be best if I just have her come and talk about the memo and talk about um, kind of the, uh, the, what, the, what this additional revenue is, um, and how, uh, why DPW needs it to be able to um, uh, fund the enterprises, in particular uh, the capital needs um, of, the, of the enterprise. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Good evening. Hi. Hello. Okay, so I'll, um, I'll just provide some context to the memo that all of you have a copy of. Um, we have done a very thorough analysis of operations that includes uh, personnel. Um, that includes our, our OOM, which are some capital items like uh, water line replacement, um, as well as large capital expenditures, which you see in the five-year capital plan that was recently submitted. Um, and we've also looked very carefully at existing debt service, which I'll talk about in a moment. So there's a lot of factors that go into the decision-making process here, and, and all of them need to be looked at together before being able to make a decision. Um, so one of the things that I, I wanted to do was capture the, the past work that DPW has done since FY17 and, and actually put a price tag on that to, to show you what we've been doing and what the expenditures are that we've been making and kind of what that means. Um, we have done a significant amount of roadway reconstruction and as part of that we do utility work. Um, so what I did in the memo was I talked about some of the big ticket reconstruction projects that we've done like Audubon Road and Hankley Street and Day Avenue um, and I've, I've tallied up what we've spent out of the water enterprise on those projects and others um, and that's pushing two million dollars you know so just in, in the last really 18 months we've spent a significant amount of money in what I would call just very basic infrastructure repairs that, that would be expected of a municipal water supplier. Um, and this is to you know, keep the system functioning uh, appropriately. Um, we have coming up in, in the next fiscal year, so this summer for this uh, construction season, uh, we're going to be making some improvements on Chesterfield Road as well as Hampton Avenue. So we intend to continue this sort of aggressive schedule of water line replacement. Um, and this is based on the water asset management plan that, that was produced for us uh, several years ago that, that we continue to follow the recommendations of um, from our consultant. Um, so that's, you know, one of the things we need to look at is, okay, we're sort of doing these basic, you know, water and soil line repairs, but we also have to look at what are the 
really large infrastructure repairs that need to happen that are sort of outside of, okay, on this road, this water line needs to be replaced. And we have some very significant projects that you saw in the capital plan, and there's four of them in particular that, that I will just spend a minute talking about. Um, the first is the wastewater treatment plan. I'm kind of talking about both sewer and water together here, just for simplicity's sake. Um, first is the improvements to the wastewater treatment plant. And you know, this is something that's sort of been long developing, it's been talked about over many years. Well, it's actually happening now. And I've described in the memo, you know, what has been going on, how much money we've spent, and, and we are really ramping up and preparing to uh, put quite a bit of money into that plant, and it is imminent. Um, and I, I believe in the memo I stated um, that we're looking at more than $22 million over the next five years, and, and that's a real number. Um, and, and we are close to being ready to, um, to affect these repairs. Um, so when we think about $22 million, this is kind of the first phase of, of these upgrades. And based on our comprehensive wastewater management plan, um, we're, we're looking at more than 60 additional million dollars on top of the 22 to you know, upgrade the plant and upgrade the pump stations and, and this, is the, this is a project that has to happen. So when we set sewer rates, we need to have an eye towards you know, there are significant upgrades that need to happen to our system outside of just kind of the maintenance of our operations, our personnel you know, replace the sewer line on X street. Um, this is sort of big picture stuff that needs to happen at the plant. Um, so I'll, I'll shift back to the water side now. Um, we have three very significant categories in the water side. Um, first is the Audubon tank. Um, this is uh, constructed in 1935. Um, again, I described this in detail in the capital plan, so I'll just sort of gloss over it here. But, but, but the tank needed, is part of the least high pressure system, uh, and it needs rehabilitation. Uh, so we're looking at over a million dollars in, in rehabilitation of this tank. Um, reservoir construction, we have three active drinking water reservoirs. Um, and we need to do uh, more than $8 million worth of work on those reservoirs, uh, spillway and embankment rehabilitation, aux auxiliary spillway construction. Um, so these are, these are sort of long range projects that we know of to address deficiencies in our drinking water reservoirs. Um, the third project in the water side is transmission main rehabilitation. So we're talking 20,200 linear feet of transmission main that provides water to the city from the water treatment plant. And it runs through a swamp and it's largely inaccessible. Um, it's also more than 100 years old. Um, and uh, we need to start the process of uh, design and permitting and ultimately constructing a new uh, line in a more convenient location. So, so those are kind of the big ticket items in the enterprise is sort of over and above our normal operations and, and water and sewer line construction. Um, so we're, you know, we're sort of looking to the future with this, but it's also important to look to the past. So one of the things we look at is you know, what, what is the history of the enterprise and how did we get where we are? Um, in 2006, the city bonded over $25 million for the construction of our current water treatment plant. Um, that is, uh, that, that service continues to be with us, very much so, um, to the point where it was 29% of our total revenue in FY17. Um, that, that service does not fall off the books until FY2028. Uh, so it, it, it starts to become a little bit of a capacity issue, you know, even with level funding the budget for, you know, operations and sort of standard repairs. Um, you know, we cannot assume further debt when we have the current level of debt that we're still paying for um, from something that happened in 2006, which was mandated that it happened, you know, we had to build a plant, um, but, but this is sort of the position we're in where, where we have to have an eye sort of towards history and towards the future. Um, so that was also part of the thought process when we think about the numbers that we're looking at for the wastewater treatment plant, you know, we're, we're sort of going through the plant and, and rehabilitating it, but, you know, the numbers are very similar to the investment we have in making water infrastructure. So we think about what we're doing in the sewer enterprise, we, we want to look at what happened in the water enterprise and understand that we're heading in the same direction in the sewer enterprise. So with all of that uh, being said, we're, we're proposing a modest increase in rates um, with an eye towards these large infrastructure projects. 
um, keeping debt service at, at sort of manageable levels and, and providing long-term rate stability. So that was all, that's just kind of the, the thought process that got us to where we are. Um, so the mayor ran through what the numbers are. Um, you know, I've, I've written in the memo what, what we anticipate, um, you know, sort of based on, on historical usage, what we, <coughs> excuse me, anticipate um, in additional revenue. Um, we feel like this revenue uh, will provide us an opportunity to assume more debt service to begin the process of, of permitting and design for some of these projects. Um, and, it, you know, so, so the big question here is like, well, what are the impacts on residents going to do for, for something like this? Um, so we've, we've done a, 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 some modeling and, you know, I can talk in, in sort of generalities here. Um, we currently have 8,681 water accounts in the city. And of those, 7,271 are 5 eighths meters. So I, I, I think it's safe to say that you know our standard residential customer has a 5 eighths meter. Um, and looking at usage, um, the, the typical person who would have this 5 eighths meter, who's a residential customer, uses about 15 CCF per quarter. So like in real language, uh, it's a little over 11,000 gallons of water per quarter. It turns out to about 45,000 gallons per year. Um, so we, we did an analysis of, of with these proposed rate increases in water, you know, what would this typical residence bill look like? And we anticipate that, that generally speaking, you're looking at about 60 cents a quarter increase, um, $2.40 a year. Um, so $2.40. And again, this is a typical residential customer with a 5 eighths meter. So this, this would not apply to like a business or- That's about 90% of the- yeah, it's it's you, you have you to divide yeah seventy two seventy one into eighty six eighty one and okay, so eighty seven percent. Your percent. Yeah. That qualifies for vast majority. That's yeah. that's the vast majority of, of folks in uh, in Northampton. Um, so then when you when you look at the increase in sewer, um, we'd be looking at an increase of, of about a dollar eighty per quarter in, in sewer for a total of seven dollars and twenty cents a year increase in sewer. So less than ten dollars across. Across the, the board, nine dollars and sixty cents is what you're looking at. So it, you know this this is going to give us uh, some flexibility in terms of debt service for these large capital expenditures that we have an eye towards, and, and it's and it's also important to understand that you know these projects are long developing, and, and I think that everyone you know sort of knows the history of the wastewater treatment plant, and and you know it, it, it sort of gained traction, gained traction, gained traction, and now you know it's actually happening. Um, but there's plenty of uh, permitting and design and, and, and work that has to go into these projects before they can actually launch. And so, you know, the, these, these sort of big ticket items that I've just spoken about, you know, we need to be moving in the same direction so that we can actually affect these upgrades and this increased revenue will help to get us where we're going. Mm -hmm. And much like the mandating of the water plant, the sewage treatment plant is a mandated repair as well as so. We are, I, I want to be careful how I answer that question. You know, the, the EPA and DEP uh, regulates our activities on both the water and the wastewater side. Um, we are currently in compliance on both sides. Uh, any upgrades we do are under their jurisdiction uh, and in accordance with their regulation. But we are upgrading in some cases like 1960s and 1970s. Oh, even electrical sure. and other te technology, yeah. And we, and we also have to consider what future ma regulations might bring to, so you know, we sort of have an eye for its efficiencies and, and you know, what might our discharge permit look like two, three years from now. Council of the Bar, do you have a question? You know, uh, down on, on the water treatment plant, did you estimate what, 22 million? What's the total amount? And how, my question is, where are you going to get all this money? Well, the water plant's already been spent. Yeah, the water plant was, was bonded in 2006 right. for $25,853,996. So we continue to pay that service on the Oh, okay. Yeah. 
and that falls off in 2028. So right now, a third of the water enterprise fund budget is debt on that plan. So of like six million, we're paying two, two. million. We're paying about two million, two million a year in debt on that mm -hmm. plan. It's until 2028. So that cleared it. Yeah. And similarly for the um, sewer what wastewater upgrades, I mean this modest increase isn't going to fund that. We still need to go out for a oh, okay. um, bond. When would you bond? The, the sewer, the sewer is going. You know, as Donna works through with the consultant, what how we're going to phase this. Some of it will be covered by the amount of money that we have been setting aside in stabilization for this very thing. Um, stabilization funding. Remember the balance, but it's like six or seven million right now. So the so the improvements at the sewer plant will be a combination of stabilization fund, which we have in hand, so it'll be cash, mm -hmm. and a combination of bond. So so we you know we will work with our financial advisors once we know what the schedule of work is going to look like and the estimates to come up with the plan that is the best combination use of cash and and borrowed. So so we haven't gotten to that point. Other questions? Um, so, I mean, obviously, we always concerned about we should be concerned about raising people's um, costs, but this is such a modest increase, and the numbers you're presenting are so very large. Is this sufficient, or is the revenue that will be increased by this we see is not all that much? Um, so, obviously, it will help, but. It, I think it's important as we go through this process that we are deliberate and that we are responsible um, with stability in rates. And so the idea here is that as we gradually phase these projects in, um, we continue to have a conversation about what is appropriate fee structure, you know, fee for service, fee for volumetric consumption in the enterprises. But I don't think we should assume that we're going to do a one or two percent increase like we're doing now, and that's going to take care of it. No, no, no. It's no, an no. incremental no. increase, no. and probably will keep happening incrementally till 2028, and we free up that money from the water plant. To I think it's important that that everyone understand that there's so much infrastructure that can't be seen. Um, you know, when you see us digging in the roadway and we're replacing the water main, you know, that's that's sort of the, the tip of the proverbial iceberg. And and you know, one of the reasons I I gave numbers, you know, related to okay, we've done these roadway reconstruction projects, you know, and here's two million dollars. You know, two million dollars goes very very quickly. Um, and if you think about what the overall size of the enterprise is, and we've just spent $2 million on water lines and you know, four, four streets, um, you know, we have all this other infrastructure like reservoirs and mm -hmm. the water treatment plant, which yes, it's been built and we're still paying the bond, but that actually needs to be maintained. And, and there's equipment there that you know, fails and needs to be replaced or repaired. Um, so, so there's plenty of infrastructure that, that is sort of out there that folks might not necessarily be aware of that, that is uh, not inexpensive. So Donna, are you planning on doing some form of a presentation so the public, because you're just talking about that people don't understand apparently what actually needs to be done, but you're explaining to us why don't you do a presentation like with a filming or something? This is what needs to be done. This is the problem we have here. I guess I would. Be done there? Well, my response would be, um, we did. Well, we did a presentation. Well, we did the capital program, which has all these projects in it, um, and we have done presentations in the past. And this um, is, in fact, a public hearing. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, and that that presentation is on the website. Yeah, the well, we have the one, the, that was the one from a couple of years ago when we were doing the rate restructuring, but obviously the projects have changed and, right. and funding has changed. But I mean, the main document is to look at the capital improvement program because that shows you what we're anticipating for costs out over the next several years, yeah. five years, and that's what's here. So, um, and so 
and that would just be so we didn't we weren't really sure because we've been talking about this for the last couple of years and we did a pretty in-depth in FY17 um, when we were talking about the rate structure shift uh, so we didn't really know we wanted to kind of see how this went so we didn't put together a PowerPoint um, oh I know I'll hear about the two dollars and forty cents a year a year yeah mm -hmm. But one of the things I want to be careful of is to make everyone aware of these projects. But you know, we will not be replacing the transmission in the next year. Um, mm -hmm. You know, these these are sort of long-term, long-developing projects, and we need to keep an eye on them. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to stand here and and overpromise that this is going to be done, you know, immediately because we have a process that we need to go through. So. If, you know, as, as we stand before you today, this is a modest increase with an eye toward where we are headed um, that isn't especially, um, it, you know, it's not going to happen tomorrow, but it's something that we need to be planning for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would say, I mean, for those of us who have residents that might see some, an increase in their, in their water bill, if they want to contact us about the 60 cent increase per quarter, I think we could have the conversation with them about that because it's, you know, it's really not much, 60 cents and maybe another dollar twenty for the sewer. It is to some people. And, and again, this is, the, this is the average customer. It's going to, yeah. you, your results will vary mm -hmm. um, depending on your use. So. Yeah, I mean, there's plenty of folks who are using, it, you know, remember that's, that's the under 16 CCF. Um, and, and, and this is just sort of, you know, generally speaking, but, but for those residential folks who are consuming a lot of water, um, and their bill is going to be adjusted accordingly. Oh, it's a conservation. <laughs> and, and we do have the low income discount for people who qualify for low income. They're, all of their you know, fixed fees are waived. 335 uh, out of the roughly 8,200 meters. Are, are free right now. Yeah, so there's 335 people who qualify. It's about uh, 4%. Mm -hmm. yeah. Who get, when you, when you said free? The, the, the yeah. fixed charges get waived, the meter, you know, because on your bill oh, you have I a see. meter right. fee. Yeah. And so right. we, that was the, that we developed that when we did the changes in FY17, that that would be for folks who met the low income, because then the, they would not have to pay any of the fixed fees. They would Just only pay for their water. Yeah. Is there any indication that since we moved to the tier system that people have been more, um, have conserved more? Uh, you know, we've, we've run the, the data and sort of charted it and, and you know, water consumption is a funny thing. It, it, it's mm -hmm. largely weather dependent, believe it or not. Um, so what I can say is overall it appears to be trending down, but, but we don't have enough data at this point to, to make a specific comment on that. We also had a lot of work, extended water bans during the summer, which I presume plays into that. No. It does, but it's, you know, it's hard to just sort of have, you know, 18 months of data and try to make some sort of chart out of it. You know, it's, it's, it, it, we need a little more data before we're able to make it. We've also added more homes, too. I mean, we, uh, we, we yeah, are adding more residents. Yeah, our number of meters increases. So, um, so I don't know. We'll have to see what the trends are. <laughs> But certainly the incentive is there that if you want to pay a lower rate, then you try to conserve and stay under 16 CCF. And the 16 CCF was the number that the state DEP uses as the sure. sort of the sweet spot for a residential customer. If, you, if we want to conserve water, that's what we should be promoting. Yeah. What was so, the last time that they've changed that, Mayor? The state? Um, I don't know. This is just a. It's actually. I think it's a federal. It's like an EPA. We we found it in an EPA book that talked about um, you know this number of 16 CCF being sort of like the goal that you should be looking for. Um, we have like a little graphic on our mm -hmm. web page about it, but that was what we used, and that's what our consultants said was sort of the the the, the, the good cutoff point for a conservation rate. Mm -hmm. So. And, and the thing to realize is if you go over 16 CCF, you're still paying a lower rate for those first 16. It's not like if you go over 16, you're paying a higher rate on, for on all the 16, of it. Yeah. You're paying a low rate up, lower rate up to 16, and then you're only paying the higher rate on the when you go over. Mm -hmm. 
So it's not like if you just tip over, you're paying the whole thing like back mm -hmm. at a higher rate. So, um, Councilor Nash, being our <coughs> only member of the public here, <laughs> do you have any? Uh, do you have any input or questions or? No, this this all makes sense to me. You know, uh, Director Lascali gave me a tour of the wastewater and our and plant a few weeks a, a month or so ago, and yeah, we, we really need these upgrades, and I'm really glad we're doing all of this forward thinking here. So, I, I think it's a reasonable increase based on all of the stuff we got to do. Any other questions for? The mayor or director yeah. of the sky? No, we good? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for coming. Yeah. So do you have a motion to close the public? Motion to close the public. Thank you. Okay. okay. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. And do we have a direct uh, motion for a positive recommendation? I move for a positive recommendation. Second. Thank you. Any discussion on that recommendation? No. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Um, and I think that completes our agenda for tonight. Um, I don't have any new business. Does anyone have any new business? Motion adjourned. Second. All in favor? Aye. Thank Aye. you all.